Okay. Then off we go. All right, so today's lecture is about uh, a family of max flow algorithms called the, the push relabel family. Um, just to remind us, again, uh, the last sort of segment of class is, is sort of doing these uh, slightly different than, than kind of worst case, worst case running time. You know, we're doing amortized analysis type stuff this week, and then we'll do some kind of randomized expected, expected value type of stuff next week. Um, so it's not necessarily worst case in the strictest sense of the word like we did bef basically everything up to before midterm two. Uh, but it, it, you'll see that sort of all of these regimes are still very well qualified and they're still going to be kind of getting a certain performance metric kind of no matter the input, no matter the user, no matter the external uh, circumstances. So um, you'll still get uh, a certain kind of sort of worst case on average type of uh, performance uh, in all these things. Okay. Now, um, and in last class, we introduced amortized analysis and uh, let's see. So we, besides defining kind of amortized analysis, Technically, we, we talked about a couple methods, including these credit charging schemes. That was usually the most popular way to do things when we did things as a class. Um, we also talk, uh, introduced a potential method. Some of the examples, examples that you guys uh, are all kind of familiar with, include binary counters, uh, array lists, and just doubling the size of the underlying array, uh, a lazy approach to binary search trees, and making queues with stacks. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so today, today's a, a max flow algorithm. Uh, they're, of course, kind of interesting in themselves. They'll be the fastest algorithms we'll see for max flow. But, but why are we doing it uh, with respect to amortized analysis and these other topics? This feels like something that comes before midterm two. It's because these algorithms uh, to prove them, we'll kind of use amortized analysis, so use potential functions uh, in what I feel is sort of a nice and, a, and an elegant way, and uh, it's fun, uh, and it'll give us an example of amortized analysis that is not a data structure. Amortized analysis is typically associated with data structures, but the kind of style of thinking can be used to facilitate other things as well. Uh, max flow is a problem that we're interested in, and it's relatively fun and combinatorial. So... Uh, it will give us some chance to practice with potential functions and stuff like that. Okay. All right. So. Um, okay. So let me let me um, refresh our memory. And, and uh, so he, again, uh, max flow. I kind of want to send as much flow from S to T uh, as possible. You're given some capacities, and. Uh, you know, uh, we, we had an original algorithm, this Ford Fulkerson algorithm, which was sort of fine for edge disjoint paths, but with capacities, it can be slow because each iteration only routes one unit of flow. So the subsequent lecture, we introduced um, this shortest augmenting path idea of Edmonds and Karp, uh, almost a natural heuristic. You might have coded it anyway if you're implementing the augmenting path approach. And, uh, but the idea was, okay, you're going to augment from S to T, but always choose the shortest path from S to T in the residual graph. By shortest, I mean fewest number of edges. Okay. And, uh, and then otherwise update the residual graph and do everything just like before. Okay. And, uh, okay, fine. So uh, just to remind us of sort of the analysis, the analysis was focusing on the distances from the source in the residual graph. Okay, and the key lemma was as long as I'm augmenting along the shortest path, the distance from S to V for so any vertex V never goes down. It only goes up, and so you sort of in the residual graph, every vertex is getting further and further away from V over time. We had to be a little bit careful to do this proof. There was a couple cases. You know, stuff like this and built layers and stuff like that. Okay, but really the focus was on distances in the residual graph. 
in particular because we want to get to a point where there's no path left from S to T. So as soon as the distance kind of must have been at least N, uh, then there is no way to get from S to T because it's a path. Um, so uh, anyway, so those were the kind of the key points uh, of this analysis. And this is how we got a strongly polynomial time was this role of, of distances in a dual graph. A residual graph. Okay, so uh, uh, so that that's maybe a reasonable uh, motive starting point to introduce this quote unquote push relabel framework, which is going to take some of these concepts but relax them. Okay, and then that'll lead ultimately to better algorithms. Uh, maybe I should also mention as a side the algorithms I, I will present today. I think are actually the most practical ones in practice, besides getting the best running times. We'll see. Okay, so okay, so the push relabel framework is uh, going to take some of these uh, definitions from before and relax them a little bit. Okay, so I'll give more uh, details in a moment. But sort of instead of always having a flow from S to T, we're going to have some object called a pre-flow. It's going to look a lot like a flow, but it's going to cheat a little bit in some ways. And uh, the other is... Uh, Labels, we're going to kind of assign labels to every vertex at every point in time. They're going to sort of act like distance labels, and we'll make that clear with one or two lemmas. Okay, but we're sort of managing these labels ourselves. They're not necessarily the distance from point A to point B in the residual graph. Okay, and, okay but the pre-flow is going to kind of act a little bit like a flow, and the labels are going to act a little bit like distances. Now let me expand. Okay, so, all right, so what do I mean by, by pre-flow? So again, your input is some directed graph, and you have two vertices, S and T, and the edges have capacities, right? And I want to send a lot of flow from S to T. And when we did flow, we had two basic constraints. One was the capacity constraints, the amount of flow on an edge, the most the capacity on the edge. And the other constraint was kind of what goes in at what goes, is what goes out at all the intermediate vertices. So we always had conservation of flow at every vertex that's not S or T. So the only difference here is that I'm going to allow these non-terminal vertices to hold on to extra flow at any given point in time. Okay, that's the only difference between a quote-unquote flow and a quote-unquote pre-flow, is that these non-terminal vertices that are sort of in the middle of your algorithm you ultimately want to compute a flow, but in the intermediate stages, a vertex can save up some flow. It can save up some water. Okay, so I'm using uh, f hat v to denote the difference of the amount of flow going in minus the amount of flow going out. Okay, so the only constraint is that this quantity is always non-negative. So uh, I guess in this, this silly example in the bottom left, I have... Uh, Three units of flow coming out on one edge, two on the other. So that's five going in. Then I have one leaving and two leaving. That's three going out. So net flow uh, is two, or the excess flow at V is two. Okay. So uh, the, the, this algorithmic framework is going to allow us uh, to hold on to extra flow at various vertices. Eventually, it needs to address all these things and get all that flow into T or something. But until it does, it's allowed to cheat in this regard. Okay, so that's that's one thing. The other thing, oh, and then I'll mention that, you know, we can still define a residual graph with respect to our pre-flow, just like we did for regular flow, where if I'm, uh, if, uh, you know, from point A to point B, I originally had a capacity five, right? and I send over, say, three units of flow, then, uh, sort of as, as before, my residual graph uh, will have capacity two in one direction and then capacity three in the other direction. The reverse direction is really mapping to sort of reversing the, the actual flow you've already routed. Okay, there were pre-flow. Okay, so that concept uh, just transfers over exactly like before. You can always update a residual graph. Okay, all right, so that's good. Now, okay, 
Now the other thing we'll have is uh, these labels or levels. So for every vertex, I'm going to assign some non-negative value from zero up to, we'll get an upper bound of like 2n or something. Okay. Uh, and it, we have a couple rules. So one is that uh, the sink is always at level 0 and the source is at level n. So one thing a little bit different from Edmonds Carp is that we're often going to focus on the distance 2t as opposed to the distance from s. Sort of, it'll be same style argument, but something flipped there. Okay. So uh, I have these layers, and I've sort of uh, sent everything. And then, and then the rule is that um, every edge uh, uh, can only go down um, by one level. So, so let me explain. Uh, if I have an edge, I guess I forgot that. If I have an edge E is equal to U V. Okay, that's in the residual graph. So I'll write E sub F because kind of E might change depending on what F is right now. Okay. Then uh, uh, the rule is that, um, you know, if, if this is U uh, and that's V, V has to, can only be one layer smaller than U. Okay, so, so an edge can, can only go, in a residual graph, can only go forward or closer to T uh, by one layer, sorry, from your point of view, can only get closer to T by one layer at a time. Okay. Edges are allowed to go arbitrarily far in reverse. It could have been like that. That would have been fine. It could have been on the same layer. That's also fine. But if it's going forward, it can't go that far forward. It can only go one layer forward. Okay. So those are, are, are uh, the rules uh, of this framework. Um, uh, okay, so, fine. Okay, so that's, uh, okay, so that, those are the things, uh, compared to flows, now vertices are allowed to save up flow at any given time. Uh, the vertices that have excess flow are going to be called active vertices. Uh, and then the layers, the levels, uh, are constrained to first have S and T as sort of opposite ends of the, of this, of these layers. And, and that an edge can only go towards D by towards T by, by one layer at most. It can't jump forward by more than one layer. Okay. So kind of weird ad hoc rules. Okay. So okay, so so initially uh, when you start with a uh, uh, just a generic uh, ST flow problem uh, in a directed graph. You know, the first issue is that uh, sort of edges can only go forwards at a time. So what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to take, so if originally our graph, you know, had a bunch of edges leading from S, right? And the issue is that, okay, I might have to go really far in particular if there's an edge from S to T. There's no way I can set S to be level N and T to be level zero and still have that edge from S to T without breaking all these rules. So what well, the first thing we do when we initialize the algorithm is that for all of these edges uh, leaving S, I'm going to saturate them. Okay, so if this edge had capacity 5, I'm just immediately going to push 5 units of flow along this edge. If this edge had capacity 3, I'll send 3 units of flow out of this edge. Okay, and as a result, all these edges will disappear from the residual graph and they'll be going backwards. Something like that. Okay. So, all right. So we're going to we're going to saturate all of the edges leaving S. Okay. And then now the rules say, okay, I have to set level S to be n. And then everyone else, I'm going to set to be level zero. Yeah. That should be S. The outcut. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, every edge. Uh, okay. So every edge is. I'm just that leaves the source. I'm going to saturate right away. So S has no forward edges, and then the rest of the graph is all going to sit at level zero, which means it's going to easily satisfy all those level constraints because they're all on the same level. Okay, so there'll be a few backwards edges initially pointed back to S. I have an example coming up. 
uh, and all the other, the entire graph will, except for S will be sitting at level zero. And so there's also no issue in terms of those level constraints being satisfied. All right, so, okay, so, yeah, there's a few, there's a few moving, there's, there's several kind of moving parts to this algorithm, although they're all individually kind of simple. Okay. So, okay, so I want to compute a max flow from S to T. We sort of doing this pre-flow thing. I kind of initially push out tons of flow from S. Uh, basically, as much flow as possible, right? Because uh, the out cut from S is one possible ST cut. Okay, and then gradually my goal is I have all these vertices now sitting in the middle of the graph to have extra flow. And I want to gradually push that flow towards T. Okay, Or I may find that it's too much flow out there, so they sort of have to get pushed back towards S. So I'm going to call a, a, a vertex active. Um, if it has more flow at the current point in time, more flow coming in than going out. Okay, so that those are the vertices. Too much flow. And uh, uh, I'll give the full algorithm in a moment, but basically we're going to gradually try to address these active vertices with two possible operations. One is I'm going to choose a vertex and then try to find an edge that goes forward and send flow along that edge. So it's sort of close to towards T. Or if I can't find any edge going forwards, then I can actually promote U by one layer. I guess for you that's backwards. <coughs> okay, so let me uh, let me explain. Again, uh, I will have an e example, a small example, so we get used to the algorithm in a moment. Okay, so I have some vertex U that's currently active, so it has a little extra flow. Um, at the moment, okay, and let's say that there is uh, a forward edge leaving you. So in this picture, uh, you know, there's some there's some V that's exactly one layer below you, okay, and there's some edge in the residual graph on which I can push some flow, okay. and. Okay, now, and so I have some extra flow at U, and, and, and I think all the algorithms we see today is just going to try to push as much flow as we can along that edge. Okay, so that, that really is the minimum of two quantities. One is sort of how much capacity was on this residual edge. So I'll write C sub F as sort of the, as F changes, the residual capacity changes. Okay, so I try to push as much flow as possible along the edge, or... Uh, maybe there's plenty of capacity on the edge, but there's not that much flow at U. So the other quantity is the excess at U. Okay, so uh, by that means uh, when I push up, when I do a push, one of two things should happen. I should either use up the entire residual edge, and it'll kind of disappear from the residual graph. That's good. Or um, I'll get rid of all the extra flow at U. And at some level, it's kind of one layer closer to T. And in some sense, that feels like progress. Okay, we'll have to sharpen up that intuition. Okay, so I either saturate an edge, so to speak, or I kind of use up the entire active vertex in one of these push operations. Okay. All right, so that's, that's one of the two push relabel operations. The other one is relabel. So we only do this if that vertex U doesn't have any forward edge. So I have an active vertex. I want to push out flow, but I can't push flow forward. You might have other edges uh, that's going backwards or to the same layer, but I'm not going to use those. Okay. So there's no forward edge with respect to our labels, even though there's extra flow. In that case, uh, it would be safe if I had another line here, um, it would be safe to take U and bump them up one layer. It won't violate any of my label constraints because there's no forward edge. There's nothing that's going to be two edges forward. That's really the one thing I'm worried about because there's no edge. That was one forward to begin with. Okay, so 
if there's no forward edge, then it's safe to, to take U and bump it up by one level without violating any of my constraints. Okay, so, uh, right, so I think from your point of view, T is over here and S is over here. I have sort of flow sitting in the middle of the graph. My goal is sort of to gradually push the flow towards T, but if I can't, I'll bump them up the level and see if there's not new edges that I can push down. Okay? And uh, at some point, if I really keep failing to push flow, it's going to show up on the other side of S. It'll flip onto the other side of S, and now I could potentially push flow back into S as well. So that's sort of what's kind of going on. Okay, so, all right, so now here's the, uh, here's the, uh, uh, then, then the algorithm, uh, uh, which seems absurd. So as long as there's some active vertex that's not one of our terminal vertices, it's not S and it's not T, uh, and you can choose any one you want, later we'll discuss some strategies for which one to choose. So while there's an active vertex, I'm either going to try uh, actually, one second. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm either going to try to sort of push along uh, some forward edge, uh, leaving V. Okay. And if I can't find any forward edge, uh, so only if there is no forward edge, I'm actually allowed to do this. Otherwise, um, I'm going to, uh, sorry, not push, increase the label of V. Okay, so that's, that's the entire algorithm. Every iteration, I try to find a vertex that still has too much flow. And then I either find an edge that goes forward and I push as much flow as I can, or I can't find an edge so it's safe to promote the vertex by one level. And if we're lucky, that might create new forward edges. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, there's a... Uh, uh, um, it's uh, it's a ridiculous algorithm, okay? So um, I think there's some some uh, obvious high level concerns. Uh, you know, some some questions include like um, when will it ever actually get a regular flow, right? If we have a pre flow the whole time, and it's not clear we ever quite even get to a flow, it's just kind of doing little things and marching on and on let alone actually computing a maximum flow, right? So that's an issue. There's another question of, uh, uh, you know, is this thing ever even going to terminate, right? It's just a loop doing these two basic operations. And then let alone, can we actually show it has a fast running time? Okay, so uh, I think at this stage, this is sort of just a mysterious algorithm. All right, uh, but it's very simple, um, and, and we'll get compelling uh, theoretical bounds too, but I think the simplicity of it, um, especially since you're kind of like pushing along, if you imagine coding it, right? Pushing along one edge, it just seems simpler than augmenting along a whole path. Uh, so, so in practice, this algorithm actually performs very well. Okay, so uh, I set up a, a toy example uh, I'm not sure how compelling it will be. I haven't worked it out myself. Um, uh, just to make sure we have a good sense of uh, how the algorithm works um, and what it's doing. Okay. So, okay. So here, uh, again, the graph is, is uh, uh, very simple. I think we can all see, uh, so the purple is the capacities. Uh, what is the size of the maximum flow in this example graph? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think 201. I think you could send uh, sort of 100 units along the top, 100 units along the bottom, and then one more unit across the diagonal. Okay. All right. So. Um, all right. So uh, this is also a graph that would, that could potentially give Ford Fulkerson a very hard time because of the large capacity. So I thought that would make an interesting example. Okay. Uh, okay, so what would the algorithm do first? The first thing it does is it uh, pushes as much flow as it can out of S and T. Okay, so I will write in uh, uh, I'll write in yellow sort of how much flow is being sent over the edge at any given point in time, and I'll, and I'll update this. Okay, uh, and so if we do that, then we'll see that um, x has uh, sort of 100 units of extra flow, and y has 100 units of extra flow. And in the residual graph, since we'll use up the whole forwards edge, we'll sort of have edges going backwards. Okay, And then we still have these edges going forwards, uh, as well as the edge between from x to y. Okay, So I think I've correctly drawn the residual graph initially. So, so again, we initially just push as much flow as we can. Here, that's 300 total units, so that's too much. At some point, we're going to have to fix that, uh, which means I now have, oh, this is a mistake, 200 units of flow sitting at x and 100 units of flow sitting at y. Okay? All right, so um, I'll let you guys... Uh, 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 dictate how to do the algorithm. So the code hopefully is readable on the top left and some of the rules are hopefully readable on the right. Um, so you can choose an active vertex and then we try to pick an edge leaving that goes forwards or we relabel it, etc. So uh, the vertex here is named S, X, T, and Y. Of course, S and T don't really move, so you're only going to be choosing X or Y. So just shout one out and we'll figure out what to do. Yeah. Y, okay. So, so we select Y. Um, uh, it has 100 units of flow. And then we have two choices. Well, we first try to see if there's any forward edges leaving Y. Are there any forward edges leaving Y? Uh, there's a nod. Okay, which, which edge goes forward? Same level. Ah, same level. So that doesn't quite count. So for us, forward really means strictly forward. So, so failing to find a, a forward edge, we have to... Um, uh, we can only relabel. So let me do that. So I'll move this up one level uh, and redraw those edges. Okay. All right. Now pick a pick an active vertex. Either one's fine. Y. Okay, we pick Y, and now we do. Or if you, yeah, now we do have a forward edge. We only have one choice. Okay, so uh, we have one forward edge from Y to T. Okay, so uh, and it has capacity 200, but Y only has 100 units of flow sitting on it, so I can only send 100 units of flow. So let's do that. So I'll send 100 units of flow. Uh, okay, which is great. We sort of cashed in 100 points at T. It'll sit there. We never select T. T doesn't count as one of those active vertices. Uh, y now has uh, no excess flow, so it's not active anymore. Um, and I guess, yeah, technically we'll have a reverse edge from T to Y, but we'll never use this edge because we don't really take flow out of the sink. But I'll leave it there just to be clear. Okay. All right, so that, that makes sense. We push flow along that edge from Y to T. Okay, choose a, an active vertex. X. X, okay. All right, I look at X. Do I have any forward edges? Yes, yes. which edge? Uh, from X to T? 
Uh, that's in the same level. So that doesn't count as forward edge yet. So forward is really with respect to these levels. The levels are also uh, highlighted by their dashed lines, the dotted lines. Uh, that, uh, that's now a backwards edge. Okay, so there's no forward edges, so we have to relabel. Uh, uh, which means I, I bump it up a layer. I have to draw, redraw some stuff. Okay, so I, I would bump it up a layer. Now my residual graph in terms of the layers would look like this. Now there is a forward edge, which, which you said was a X to T. Um, so I'll push as much flow uh, as possible along the X to T edge. What's, the, what's this maximum amount of flow? 100, okay. I'll use up the entire edge. Oops, I've been doing that in yellow. Okay, so I, I send 100 and uh, consequently, the extra flow sitting at X goes down by 100. The amount of flow I've sent into T goes up to 200. Okay. Uh, and I guess we'll, 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 we'll get another edge like this in a residual graph, which we would never use. Okay. All right. We'll keep going. We're almost done, though. Uh, pick an active vertex. Yeah. I just have a question. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So that Perfect. Yes, and that's important. Uh, otherwise, we would be constrained in this upcoming step. So, yeah, so pick an active vertex. X. X, okay. And is there a forward edge? No. So, so now I can, or I have to, uh, promote up a level like that. Here, it was particularly important that we deleted that edge, or else I wouldn't have been able to do it. So, so thank you. Um, and then some things get redrawn. Okay. Um, all right, pick it up. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right. I know this is silly. Pick an active vertex. X. Well, pick a forward edge. X to Y. Okay, so I'm going to send, uh, how much flow can I send from X to Y? One? Okay, so I'm going to send all one unit of flow. Uh, now Y gets plus one. Um, now this goes backwards. I guess now we have both directions. So I'll, I'll draw both arrows like that. Um, and the excess at X becomes 99. Oh, no, we don't. Okay, we only have back direct. Uh, yes, that's right. We've used all one unit of capacity that went forwards from X to Y, so that disappeared. Good, good. All right. Good. Now you guys are teaching me. All right. Uh, all right. Pick an active vertex. Y. Y. Uh, and then uh, pick a forward edge. Y to T. Um, so... What I would do is, is this becomes 101 units of flow uh, from Y to T. I get rid of this excess, and now I'm sending 201 units of flow from S to T. So that's great, right? Okay, so this is good. I mean, we knew the answer should be 201. I'll suggest that in some sense we're not quite done yet. How come we're not quite done? Yeah. Yeah, so we still have excess at x. So sort of what I've uh, written in yellow in the original graph doesn't really is not a full flow. So let's keep going until we get a full flow and see how the the, the, the algorithm naturally addresses itself. Um, uh, okay, so um, all right, so pick an active vertex. Okay, uh, is there a forward edge? Oh, sorry. No, so, okay, so we have to promote it. Uh, redraw the lines. Okay. Uh, pick an active vertex. Okay. Uh, is there a forward edge? Okay, so we'll relabel it. Oh, no. Bring it up again. I feel like I just did this. 
Now it's going like that, and that, and that. Okay, take an active vertex. Okay. Go like that. Uh, oh, there's no forward edge. So the, that X to S edge is not forward at that point in time. Uh, now, now the edges will look like this. Oh, no. It'll look like that. Take an active vertex. Is there an active edge? Yeah, which one? I know it's the X to S. And uh, how much flow can I send from X to S? Or how much? Yeah, what's the maximum amount I can send? Uh, yeah, 99. Why 99? Yeah, yeah, we can't send more than 99 because X only has 99 units of flow. So when I send that in reverse, that's going to subtract from this quantity, 101. Um, and this will go down to zero. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. So, so at this point, we actually do have a flow. We know it's a max flow because we're pretty sure the answer is 201. And one, uh, what's kind of curious, though, is, uh, is that those layers also reveal the minimum ST cut. Right, you can see sort of uh, X and S are on one side, and that, if you, if you look at the cut induced by, sorry, by putting X and S on one side, you do get an ST cut of capacity 201. Okay, so, okay, something magical happened. We got a max flow. We got a minimum cut. Okay. All right. Yeah. So does that mean you can't take S or T as your active vertex? That's right. So we never take S or T. And the goal is eventually, so we kind of, the, the algorithm is initially sending out as much flow as it can out of S, right? And that's, that's an upper bound on the max flow because S itself presents an SD cut. And then gradually, it's sort of trying to push it towards T, but if it can't, it ends up pushing up towards S. Okay. Now it's not at all clear why we will always arrive. I mean, this example was fine. Those two vertices. It's not at all clear why this will end in a flow. It's not at all clear why it ends in a max flow and stuff like that. Like, you know, it's just sort of pushing, following these very simple rules. Why should it really be doing the best possible thing? Right. That's not at all clear. Okay. So. I, I, I think it's sort of kind of miraculous that it worked on this example. It's miraculous that it, something so simple looking can work on complicated examples. Uh, it's absurd that it's the fastest algorithm we'll end up seeing in this class. It's absurd that it gets an optimum solution following such silly rules. All right, so, okay, so that's, that's that's the uh, that's the algorithm. So sort of a small small example, but hopefully that's enough to make us know what we're analyzing, help us understand what we're analyzing. Um, uh, so now we have to uh, start looking at uh, what's really going on and what is uh, what is a preflow, what is a label. Let's let's understand it a little so that we can argue that I will terminate. It will terminate with a max flow, and then eventually we can try to say it might be pretty fast. All right, so, okay, so, um, okay, so I have kind of one lemma for preflows, one lemma for labels, and then we'll start combining these things. So this is the one for preflows. Okay, so, um, let me draw, uh, I mean, I'll bring this down just to, as a reminder of what's going on. Um, okay, so, the claim is this, if F is a preflow, okay, so F is, is generally sending flow, but it's not ending up at T, right? There's kind of flow deposited at various vertices in the middle, which have excess flow. Then the claim is that, um, that I can think of F as a path packing, uh, where, but it's not just pass from S to T. It'll be sort of 
the number of paths from S to V will be equal to uh, the excess at V. So maybe I can draw, draw a picture to, to help. So in general, we sort of have S and T, right? And we kind of have uh, some kind of flow, right? And it's sending things in its mysterious ways. Um, and then it doesn't necessarily conserve flow everywhere. So there could be leftover flow here, leftover flow here. Right. So, so let's call this uh, A, B, C. So what the lemma is saying is that on an example like that, I can take my flow and think of it as three units of paths to A, two units of paths to C, five units of paths to B, and five units of paths to T. Okay. So that'll give a little bit of, we're just trying to help parse and understand what, what the preflow is. Okay, uh, okay, does anyone, it seems intuitive, right? In general, kind of at a high level, flows should sort of decompose to pass, except here those paths aren't necessarily making all the way to T. Okay, does anyone, uh, though, see a, a slick way to, Formally prove this. So again, it's not a flow just because it has some leftover vertices. But I can think of it as sort of still sort of packing paths into the capacities of various quantities depending on the excess. Let me know if there's any questions also about the kind of definitions at play. Uh, okay, so I guess I'm saying that I can sort of take, uh, in other words, I could have written, I can come up with a, a packing of paths, meaning they fit into the capacities, uh, so that um, the amount of, uh, but all, usually we usually talk about ST path packings, where all the paths were going from S to T, so this is more like a mixed bag, okay? Uh, with different destination points. And in particular, for every vertex V, the number of paths in your packing, so it's fitting inside the capacities, is equal to sort of the excess amount of flow in your preflow. So, so previously we just said, oh, if you have a flow from S to T that's sending 10 units of flow from S to T, I can kind of write that as a, as a sum of 10 paths from S to T. But now flow is sort of getting deposited in different places, and I'm just kind of saying something analogous. It generalizes that previous. Yeah. So like the whole concept of flow and the proof of it and everything like that is that you have to kind of prove that for every like in a like vertex in between that the amount going in is equal to the amount going out. But the issue here is that the amount going in isn't equal to the amount. It can be more. Yeah. Yeah. So you subtract the like, like the excess amount in each vertex from like the incoming or from the incoming edges somehow. Yeah, so you can try to like I don't know, try to un. You can okay, see, so you can try to sort of undo those three units of flow somehow within your path and gradually bring that excess down to zero for each vertex at a time, and possibly you can do this if you're careful and you do some induction. Um, there's a trick proof. Did you have? A, yeah. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, like, in whatever residual graph of this preflow, the stuff pointing back should be equal to what the excess is. Yeah. So yes, I, I agree. So all these shoulds are. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So it should. You should have these paths. You should be able to kind of find it in a residual graph because every forwards edge will give you a backwards. I mean. The flow, you'll get the reverse, so you can kind of trace it back to S, and you can try to peel off one path at a time, and then argue by induction, you'll finish, and you'll get the claim. Yeah? Given that the, algorithm, the way the algorithm works, and the way we um, kind of 
made our algorithm um, all of the excess flow of the active vertices, isn't it automatically routed back to S at the end anyway? Uh, the, the answer is yes, and I guess we're just going to articulate that uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get that down on paper, as clumsy as it may be. Okay, so here's just a quick trick proof to see this. Imagine adding um, extra edges from every vertex to T. Okay? And, and I'll make that capacity equal to the excess, or it can be infinity or whatever. Okay? And imagine extending the flow where I send three extra units, two extra units, five extra units. So I route all the excess directly to T along my magical edges that I just added. Now that will break down into a ST path packing by what you're used to. You can take that ST flow and write it as a sum of ST paths. And if you trim off those green edges, you'll get paths that don't go all the way to T. They terminate at these vertices just before T. Okay. So when I just slow is just so close to help kind of help Bridge the gap between pre-flows and, and flows. I'm not sure if it's helpful. Okay. All right, let me, let me keep going. So here's another one. And this one is probably more useful. Okay. So let's try to understand what these labels are doing. Okay. I claim that they're sort of playing a role similar to distances from S in the edmonds karp algorithm. And so this is going to sort of formalize it. So this is saying that for every two vertices x and y, the difference lx minus ly is at most the distance from x to y in the residual graph. Okay. So there's some kind of correlation or relation. I can make this picture bigger. Okay. And and these levels um, are giving lower bounds on the actual number of edges to get from point A to point B for every A and B. Okay. All right. Does anyone want to try to argue why? So if I have, the claim is that, okay, if I have a vertex uh, X at level 5 and I have a vertex Y at level 1, then the number, the shortest path from X to Y must have at least four edges. That's what the claim would be saying, because X at level 5 and Y is at level 1, LX minus LY is 4. Okay. So how come in the residual graph there has to be at least four edges to get from X to Y? Maybe X can't even get to Y, but the point is the shortest path has at least four edges. Uh, yeah, so each edge can only go forward one level. Okay. That would be the best case if I made progress every time. It's possible it'll be meandering and going back and forth, forwards and backwards. Okay. So this discipline where we said, oh, every edge can only go forwards by at most le one level is what gives us this number. Okay. So these labels are sort of acting as a surrogate or proxy for the actual distances in the residual graph. Okay. So let's look at, now let's, let's consider x is equal to s and y is equal to t, right? Because those points were fixed. In particular, s was fixed at n, t was fixed at 0. So then we always have that the distance from S to T is at least what? The level of S was N, the level of T was zero. Okay, so it says the distance is always at least N. Okay. Well, okay, what does that tell us? Yeah. Does that give us an idea of the 
words path in the grid? Yes, it does. It does. But okay, what's so weird about n? If there was a path, what's the maximum distance? Yeah. It's just every vertex. Every vertex, which would give us how many edges would be in that path? N minus 1. N minus 1. Just a little less than N. So what this lower bound tells us is that in the residual graph, there is never a path from S to T. Okay, so that's the one thing this algorithm is doing, is that uh, in some ways, it's, as opposed to always maintaining a flow like we do with augmenting paths, right? Augmenting paths, we always have a feasible flow, and the only question is whether it's max. This algorithm, in a sense, is always maintaining an ST cut, because S can never reach T in the residual graph. So if you just took all the vertices that S can reach, that'll leave out T, to find some kind of ST cut. It's not necessarily the minimum ST cut. So, okay, so one interesting property of this algorithm compared to the previous ones is that there's actually never an S to T path in a residual graph. That's the exact opposite. In the old algorithm, we kept going until there was no S to T path. Okay. All right, so let's put some of this together. All right, so uh, here then is uh, uh, we start making some progress. So uh, when we did our example, it did seem like all those vertices would only get so high up and go to such a high level before the algorithm terminates, right? But it would be nice to actually get that nailed down and say, oh, the, the, the maximum level is always this or that. Right? And it won't go off forever. So the claim is that for every active vertex, the maximum level is at most 2n. Okay, so s is here, s is always at level n. We have some other vertex, which has extra flow. And we want to claim that this is at most 2n. Okay, why? Yeah. Well, let's say that like every single um, vertex had like extra capacity in it, or at like after they route, after you route all the flow to t, then um, you would keep having to move them back until. Um, Yeah, okay, so let me, and let me also bring in a, a comment on a previous question. At some level, if V has extra flow, then the flow contains a path from S to V. Okay, so there's, somehow there's some path of flow getting routed from S to V. And then, like you're saying, that means that we're going to have all these sort of intermediate reverse. In the residual graph, all the reverse edges will be there, right? As soon as an edge carries flow, we know the opposite edge will be in the residual graph which means that the distance from V to S is at most N. Right? There's always a path from V to or N minus 1. There's always a path from V to S in a residual graph because the flow itself is routing some path of flow from S to V. Residual graph, everything will get reversed. Okay. So, in other words, we'll end up with uh, so what we showed is that we know that the, the distance, sorry, the, the, the difference in labels uh, is at most the distance. I know that this is always n, 
And because it has some excess, this is at most n minus 1. Okay. So uh, all put together, okay, it's at most 2n minus 1. Okay. So there's always kind of a path to route flow back to s is sort of what it's saying. But once you, once you have a path to route the excess flow from v back to s, then that also tells you that v can't be that far away. All right, good. All right, so uh, putting everything together, uh, here's one last lemma, and then we'll start doing some running time stuff. Okay, so we have our algorithm that's computing some preflow and some levels, okay? And uh, let's say that at some point it does run into a flow. I guess we haven't really shown it terminates yet, but just at some point during our algorithm, we keep pushing and pushing and relabeling and relabeling, and we get rid of all the active vertices. Right? That's what happened to us. We finally pushed out that flow from x back to s, and then there's no active vertices except for those terminal vertices, which we don't touch. The claim is that f is a maximum flow, and not only that, but there's going to be some empty layer. So you'll have s, and you'll have T, right? And you have all these layers in between. And there will be lots of vertices, of course. Okay. But the claim is that there will have to be at least one layer with no vertices in it. So that would be uh, this layer here has no vertices. And the claim is that if I looked at all the vertices with a higher layer, which may include vertices over here as well, That'll be one side of a minimum ST cut. Okay. That will, in particular, certify that our flow is the maximum flow. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. So, what is the what is the basic idea? So, first of all, this uh, why is there always an empty layer? Yeah. There's more layers than vertices, uh, especially because S and N are, are, are at 0 and N, and there's kind of N minus 1 in between, but there's N minus 2 vertices left. There's going to be some empty layer. Okay. And now F is a flow, and it's possible that, you know, originally, I mean, of course, originally you had some edges in the input graph, right? But, uh, okay, and... And uh, okay, so there's some. There, the green represents edges in the original graph, which leaves this set of vertices above the empty layer and must go to vertices below the empty layer. Okay, but uh, I claim that our flow. We know it's a flow. I claim that our flow has completely saturated and used up all those edges, all those green edges, which would mean that we have a flow an ST flow that saturates and has the same size as a certain ST cut, which then will mutually show that they're both optimal. But okay, but why, how can I argue that I've used up all the green edges? Yeah. Well, uh, like if you do a proof by contradiction and argue that you, and assume that you didn't use up all the green edges, then you could just run the algorithm again and then use that green edge and then and then, so you kind of like disproven that you used it up. Yeah, so let me, let me, let me uh, refine that a little. If, if I hadn't used up a green edge, okay, an edge from the orig in the original graph that's from this set, okay, then, uh, okay, so I know that, uh, so I have some kind of green edge, right? Uh, okay, so let's, so how come, so it must go forwards, right? Because it's going to some vertex, that's not in my set of vertices. My vertices are all the vertices above some layer. Okay. So if it leaves that set, it has to go down. So how come it can't... Why is that impossible as drawn? Yeah. The algorithm wouldn't determine it because there's still an active edge. Or an active... Oh, uh, no, that vertex may be inactive. The edge is there, but the vertex itself has no excess flow. In fact, uh, we're assuming that F is currently a flow 
So there is no active vertices outside S and T. Uh, or, yeah. Ah, it's going, it's go, it has to go over two layers if it did exist in the residual graph because the next layer was empty. All right, so we have this empty layer, and it's impossible for edges to jump forward by two layers. Right, as soon as there's an empty layer, then I kind of know there's no also forward edges leaving. Okay, so I can't jump over an empty layer. I can't go forwards by more than one layer. That's why such a green edge is impossible. All right, so that means that I have saturated all of the edges leaving my ST cut, so the size of the flow is equal to the size of the cut. Okay, I've used up all the edges, and they bound each other down the node. They're both perfect. They're both best possible. Okay, because the empty layer kind of ensures that we've killed off all the residual edges. Yeah? Uh, just a quick question. I remember you mentioning termination earlier. So, um the termination note, the one that we did before, where we said like the maximum level was like 2n. Yeah. Can you just say that like because the maximum level is 2n and each like vertex can only jump that far, like that it will have to terminate after that at that point? Yeah, so what, it, what this does tell us is that I can only relabel a vertex so many times, but it doesn't quite tell us that I won't do a ton of pushes forever. No, not yet. We'll, we'll, we're going to clarify that now. Okay, so, okay, so, all right, so, okay, so at least we understand why the algorithm will terminate with a maximum flow. As soon as it gets rid of all the active vertices, that means it is a flow, it's no longer a uh, pre-flow, or it is a pre-flow, but specifically a flow. And there's always an empty layer in the residual graph, and sort of that sort of gives us the cut. Everything that's, that's on one side of the layer, the S side gives us the S side of the ST cut, the T side will give us the ST side of the the T side of the SD cut, sorry. Okay, so okay, so that's why once we get rid of all the active vertices, the algorithm will at least be correct. Now, finally, in the remaining time, we need to figure out the running time. Okay. All right, so uh, any quick question? All right, hopefully we'll make time. All right, so, so when we analyze this, what we're going to do is say, okay, how many times can I relabel vertices? And how many times can I do a push? And in the course of this, it's actually helpful to classify two kinds of pushes. One is called a saturating push. So remember, whenever we push, we push as much as possible, which means I either used up the entire edge or I used up the entire vertex. Saturating push means I used up the entire edge. So the edge will disappear from the residual graph. And the other kind, uh, uncreatively named, um, a non-saturating push, Okay, so we weren't able to use up the entire edge, but instead we were able to use up the entire vertex. Okay, so it turns out that what we're going to do is we're going to count how many times do I relabel things, how many times do I do a saturating push, and how many times do I do a non-saturating push. Okay, and then besides that, okay, you need to like set up some linked lists and stuff so that you can quickly find the next active vertex and stuff like that, but it's not so interesting. So you can make sure everything runs in constant time and just worry about how many of these basic operations we do. Okay, so hopefully this is where the amortized analysis will come in in the last 10 minutes of the class. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this was already kind of suggested, but I'll ask you guys again. How come the total number of times I relabel vertices at most n squared? Which is n per vertex or so. Yeah. Um, for each vertex, we relabel it like, um, at most 2n times. So it would have to be like n times around with its own squared. Okay, so they're all bounded above by 2n or something like that. We can only relabel if it's active. If it's active, it's less than 2n minus 1 or something. So, uh, uh, okay, so each vertex can only get labeled n times each, and I guess this maybe seems obvious, but it's important to note that the labels only go up. They don't, they don't go up and down. Okay? All right, that one was easy. All right, saturating pushes. I want to claim that the number of saturating pushes is at most m times n. which is roughly uh, n per edge. 
So the number of times I kind of use up an edge on a push is at most n for every edge, or 10n, or you know, some constant times n. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, every time, okay, so uh, if I do a big saturating push, right, and then at some level I kind of uh, delete the edge, right, and the edge will only reappear in the residual graph when I push flow at some point later from V to U, right? So sometime later I have to push along the reverse edge, okay? But if I were to push in reverse, then V must be on the other side of U at some point in the future. So for the only way for U and uh, UV to reappear in the graph is if I push along V and U, which means they've also reverse order among the labels. So kind of every time uh, UV appears again, after destroying it, I know that one of those endpoints has gone up. They've both gone up and stuff like that. So I can, uh, and then meanwhile, the endpoints go up how many times? N. They each go up at uh, most n times. Okay, so uh, I can I can charge saturating an edge to increasing the labels of the endpoints. Okay, all right. The moment we've all been waiting for. Now all that's left is bounding the number of non-saturating pushes. So these are the pushes that use up all the flow, uh, all the excess flow at an active vertex. Okay. Turns out this is the most painful part we only be able to get a bound of mn squared, which is worse than the other two. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I have to be expeditious because there's a little bit more ahead in the notes. Okay. I'm going to defend, uh, I'm going to define and defend uh, a potential function. So I'm going to sum up over all the active vertices the level of the active vertex. Okay, so I'm summing up over all the active vertices the level of the active vertices, and this potential will go up and down over time. Okay. All right, so initially the potential is zero because all the active vertices are at level zero at the beginning of the algorithm. Okay. And the potential will go up and the potential will go down depending on our operations, right? So if I do a relabel, then how much does the potential change? So if I take an active vertex and I increase the level by one, what happens to our potential? Goes up by one. Okay. Now if I do a saturating push, If I do a saturating push, how much, in the worst case, will my potential go up by? Or not at all, or whatever. Give me a bad bound. You can't actually get a very good bound for this. So if I push from U to V, right, I don't necessarily deactivate U, uh, but I might activate V, right? V might have some excess. And what's the maximum level for V? Yeah. N, okay, so 2N or something, okay, but big O of N. So uh, saturating push might increase my potential by, by about N. And then finally, What about a non-saturating push? So now I get rid of all the potential at my vertex. All the uh, excess, sorry. Yeah. Well, you might be at a very low level. I mean, you might not be n. It could be 5 or 4 or 3. 
and I almost, it's okay. So you'll get, you'll kind of eliminate you, right? You will no longer be active. Now you should be careful because V might become active. V might not have been active before. Okay. So negative one. Maybe, maybe you decrease it by more or something if V was already active, but at the very least. Okay. So this will be, uh, uh, Okay, so I already know that there's n squared relabels, so the relabels can only increase my potential by n squared, right? And I already know that there's at most mn saturating pushes, so my potential can only increase by mn squared from saturating pushes. And then every non-saturating push will decrease my potential by at least one. Meanwhile, it's always non-negative. So why does so that gives us a maximum of mn squared? because the potential can only increase mn squared total. Okay. All right, so you put this all together. Uh, all right, so the, the potential is bounded above by mn squared. Non-saturating pushes can be charged, decreasing the potential. And the whole thing then is mn squared, which is better than our shortest augmenting pass. If I recall, that was m squared n. Okay. All right, I, have, I need a little bit extra time. So the only question is, can we do faster? Okay. And here I'll point out that the bottleneck is these non-saturating pushes. Okay, the other kinds of pushes were A, easier to analyze, and not very much. Okay. So... There's a lot of different strategies out there, including also some heuristics. So let me explain one natural one that you might have thought of. So it's the same algorithm, except when I'm choosing which active vertex to push, I'm always choosing the highest level. Okay. Uh, so I always choose the highest level vertex uh, to push. Okay. Now, uh, you, you automatically get for free because it's just a special case as before, you get the same upper bounds for free. And the only question is, can we improve, in particular, the set mn squared? Okay. All right. So this will be... Mm, okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to try to sketch what remains. There will be two bounds left, actually. We're going to improve n cubed in a moment. So uh, the first claim is that if you always choose the top one, you only have n cubed non-saturating pushes. Okay, does anyone want to try to guess why? So the only difference now is that when I do a saturating push from V, right, and I'm sending five units of flow this way, I knew that he was the highest level active vertex. Okay. So later on, if, he, if this vertex becomes active again, some other vertex had to have been, some other active vertex had to have been relabeled and kind of push flow up above V. So V was the highest active vertex. It pushed down flow. So there's no flow above it to get flow, anything. So by the time it gets flow again, someone else must have moved up with flow so I can charge it to that future relabeling. And there's only n squared total relabelings. Okay? All right, fine. That's n cubed. And so the only question now is, can you do better? This was supposed to be an amortized analysis segment. So I'll only sketch the potential function, and then I'll leave the, the full details in the notes. Okay? So... It turns out that with a uh, potential function argument, we can improve this bound from n cubed to n squared square root m. Okay, so if m is less than n squared, so the graph isn't very dense, this could be much better. If m is equal to n, in the extreme case, that's only n to the 2.5. Okay, and I only sketched a high level argument. The idea is this. Okay, it's partly why I, I chose this topic. So I'm going to define uh, a potential function to be the sum over all vertices that are active, okay? Uh, sorry, this should be V, okay? 
the number of vertices W that are underneath V. Okay, so it's sort of a weird um, exotic potential function. Okay, so for active vertex, uh, perhaps this is a V. For an active vertex V, okay, uh, I'm going to count up how many vertices have smaller labels or less than equal the label of V. Okay, and the argument, I'm only going to um, sketch the idea. Uh, here, it's all there in the notes. Is uh, okay. So uh, if I relabel an active vertex, then the potential can go up by at most n, right? Because I can add n vertices underneath. If I uh, uh, if I do a saturated push, uh, then I might activate another vertex, so the potential can go up by at most n. Okay, so in general, the total increase in potential is at most mn squared, okay, because of mn saturating push. Okay, and now the the one clever part of the uh, of the analysis um, is uh, when I do a non saturating push. Uh, at V, okay. uh, the potential is going to go down by the number of vertices V that have the same level as V. Okay. And the idea is that you're going to call you're going to call a thing push, or so you're going to call a push small. If this number is uh, less than square root m, and you're going to call it big, if it's, I'm so sorry guys, bigger than square root m, and the big pushes are decreasing the potential by a lot, uh, you can only have a small number of small pushes before you, you get rid of all the vertices at that level, and so between one and the two, you can charge it off. So the big pushes let you say the potential drops by a lot, and then you end up with a slightly better bound. So you're only missing about two paragraphs from the proof, so, so check that out. All right, sorry about that. Thank you very much. See you next time.